and constantly have to. I'm meant to be t- taking this thing called himeprazole, but I um I haven't been bothered. I need to make a. I need to see the doctor to see, to get I, it. I, I just yeah. I just thought that it was more than likely that you were you were that put out by seeing the tweet of Anna Soubry's thanking mm. six hundred thousand people for voting Change UK. <laughs> that you decided to reach for the Gaviscon immediately on hearing that 600,000 people had voted that way. <laughs> Entirely possible. We are live, gentlemen. Uh, oh, right. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to another episode of Fake Accents Unite. Uh, as you may have been able to distinguish, I am joined this evening by uh, my ever-present colleague, the Britisher. Good evening, sir. Good evening. And by the academic agent. Nice to have you on. Hello, sir. This is a bit like when um, when Hulk Hogan would occasionally ch- turn up on um, WWF Challenge or something like that. You know, just, just, you know, so you are, you, are you really calling yourself uh, Hulk Hogan with your the physique? Hulk, the Hulk Hogan of live <laughs> chat. Is that, is that how we have to envisage this here? Yeah, like the kind of... Uh, yeah, or, or like when the, when, the, when the Rock turned up on like Sunday Night Heat or something like that. That's right. <laughs> so, so um, I, I'm guessing you want to talk about uh, European elections, do you? A little bit. Um, there there were did, elections. Oh yeah, I know. Did I only spent. I've only what sp- happened? I've only spent five and a half hours on streams over the last two days talking about them. <laughs> so I figured that tonight would be a good time to discuss the aftermath. Um, obviously, we have. I don't know why my uh, my stream is not updating but i assume no there we go we are we are actually live always good to know that that we're actually talking to people and not just to ourselves but um yeah uh obviously a huge change um the big things that were not necessarily unexpected but things that i've I've seen come out of it are tommy robinson was not elected but he did get the most votes of any other independent candidate in history um he got around forty thousand votes uh, from from what I'm told, um, and he did put out like this uh, this kind of meme afterwards. This, I'm not going to subject you to the Snapchat video, which is what I think it was of him shirtless in bed talking about this stuff. But I will show you uh, this piece of Remainer propaganda that did get uh, put up this morning. Can you see this? Yep, uh, I don't accept the result of the election. I want a second vote. Right, and the Exposing Bigotry and Fascism group, um, the EBF, uh, said, oh, you lost, get over it. The words you lost, get over it come to mind. Um, And they've been making a big thing, this little hypocrisy meter to 100%. Of course, completely failing to um, realize that he's having a joke at their expense. (laughs) He's just completely uh, throwing it at them, throwing it back at them. Um, yeah, seems to have gone over many people's heads. So I, I'm going to say something quite unpopular now. Um, I mean, that would yeah, be a change for you, wouldn't I, it? I, I know. I, I wait until like, I'm on this show to say unpopular things. But um, I actually think that this uh, this whole election, um, before we talk about the kind of the, the general ramifications, yeah, I, sure. think it, I think it's been quite a stiff reality check to uh, our little corner of the internet. You reckon? In what in what sense? In in the sense that um, we saw play out in real time what happens when uh, internet shitlords run uh, for office, and what happens to the likes of Tommy Robinson in a real election. I think it exposed the the fact that uh, the core support for for all of these people who have millions of followers worldwide is actually quite small when you. Uh, Boil it down to a to a local. Well, when 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 you marry it up to so so obviously I was going through all the results live last night, and I think UKIP got something around a half a million votes. Um, and uh, if you look at the idea, and you look at how many people voted, right? It was thirty six point nine percent turnout, or thirty six point eight, mm-hmm. and. Um, and that is still millions of people. And if you we we did a little bit of maths, and we were like, right, Sargon's got near enough a million followers, and uh, uh, let's say conservatively that maybe one hundred and fifty thousand of those are voting age and UK based, right? And then an even smaller percentage of those are going to be 
uh, UK based voter age and in the southwest to vote for him. Um, because obviously, I think that played a, a role in the idea of, like, let's say you, you live in like the northeast, you might support what he's doing in the southwest. And if you've been following him, and you might go, yeah, like, I like the idea of him doing like the UKIP thing, but oh, he's not running in my area, and I don't really know the UKIP candidate in my area. I may as well vote Brexit Party because Farage is the face of Brexit. Um, so, like, in terms of actual electoral. Um, kind of uh, impetus it's really not that large a figure um compared to say the around five million votes that the brexit party ended up with in the end so yeah that's well, my all, take on that. all, all, all it told me is that uh these things are not these the, this list of issues are not election winning issues one immigration no longer an election winning issue number two um free speech not an election winning issue number three uh being against political correctness not an election winning issue none of these things on their own really translated into votes well uh, I, 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 I don't think you can quite draw that conclusion when this was effectively a single issue election anyway this was uh a split between like uh, i think they they i can't remember who did it someone did up a graph of like where the swings were and how much of the labor vote migrated to the brexit party and conservative and so on and so forth um and to liberal democrats and uh, and so i i just think that this is not representative of what necessarily a general election would look like if brexit were not the biggest issue on the table right now i well, think it just dominates to such a degree why do you think that um Nigel Farage, at one, uh, ran a, uh, d refused to talk about immigration, and two, ran on a diversity platform. I.e., he said, "Look at my party; it's uh, it's a rainbow coalition of black lesbians." That's that's literally the strategy. It's it's a rainbow coalition of people from every color and creed. Yes, because it, he was yeah. trying to make the point that Brexit itself is anti-partisan. And it doesn't even matter what the reasons for voting Brexit were in the first place, be that immigration, be that economy, or so on and so forth. The issue was, was that a democratic vote was held, a referendum, that was not followed through. And I'm going to make sure it's followed through. And it doesn't really matter why you voted Brexit. It's just that the majority voted Brexit. And now I'm going to make that happen. And it doesn't matter what side of the political fence you sit on, like, you know, Anne Widdicombe versus, uh, like, another, who I can't remember the name of the Labour guy. Um, mm who he's got in there, who's another one of his top candidates. But, um, you know, and people like Anziata, Rees Mogg and stuff like that, like none of these people like want to form a political entity beyond Brexit. Like as Sargon mentioned a couple of times in his campaign, there's no manifesto that's going to please those people, but those people aren't fighting for a manifesto. Even if it gets to a general election, right? Let's say it doesn't give the Conservatives the kick up the bum that they need. Uh, let's say that the um you know everything goes terribly nigel nigel farage gets elected at the next general election i think all we'll do is keep the government ticking over not really change anything uh get brexit pushed through and then immediately call another election a general election and step down from the running that's that's the way i see it well so i, I don't even see farage doing that um i think that he, he keeps he keeps making noises about it because you have he has to in order to put pressure on the conservatives to yeah. um, make a, a mess of it, but you know, so my, can I yeah. can yeah. I sort of cut in? Um, well, no, you're not allowed to be a guest on this stream making precisely, comments. Precisely. Um, you know, when it when it comes to that sort of conclusion that academic has drawn of basically saying, well, this issue or well, that issue, you know, immigration, free speech, whatever, they don't win votes. Um, I think one can't necessarily draw those conclusions from what we've seen because. Put it like this, you can be a very, very good candidate. You can be uh, a very good MP. So so let's let's assume that you are a, a very good constituency MP uh, for the Labour Party in a, you know in, in a in a contested area. And now the conservatives just basically get a surge and you're you're screwed you're just going to lose your seat. It doesn't really matter what you have done. It doesn't really matter what your what your personal uh, policies have been. Um, you will basically just be swept aside 
on a nat on a national trend and yeah. that's what i see here i see an absolute avalanche having taken place so what um what what the likes of tommy robinson or sargon of a cat actually individually stood for their individual platforms i just see them having been completely swamped completely deluged by something that was much bigger than them that kind of moved across the country and, and when those kind of national tides happen the individual candidates don't stand a chance so uh, you know in that respect if one were to expect sargon of a cat to buck the trend of ukip losing 24 seats of 24 you know you look at that and you just go how on earth was how on earth was that supposed to happen you know so that's where i think that you can't necessarily draw conclusions to you know individual policies of individual uh candidates because there was something much bigger going on beyond that there's there's a lot of people who are saying this is effectively uh, uh indie ref 2 you know this sort of like representation which is why the remainers are basically crowing at the moment because they've added up all of the hard remain and soft remain parties yes, and claimed that there was a completely meaningless and they yeah i know uh, they made it um here's an interesting thing and this i think is the thing which is going to put the fear of god into the traditional mainstream um it's this so if i again share this here we go so it's this graph you see this so um this is if the election was a general election by constituency through traditional first past the post um the column we're interested in is this net change here on the right hand side um and the majority <laughs> up here at the top uh, and i think that as a measure of national sentiment is going to have much more of an impact on the uh, traditional the big three than anything else because even the uh liberal democrats who uh, are themselves very pleased that they've you know made massive gains because they were like the um the default hard remain option for people to vote for um followed by the greens who people have less um faith in but still voted for uh in their droves the uh it doesn't make a difference in first past the post that much from what i can see here um which is in this country obviously what matters in a general election yes i mean this is in, as it's entirely theoretical because we know that would never happen what we see here no this, um, is, this, this is like um this is like uh hillary supporters saying uh oh she won the popular vote i mean every election is played on the rules of that and so we wouldn't see this uh translated as a general election i i i actually agree with britisher uh, when it comes to this doesn't mean anything basically this is as bad as uh it, it doesn't need uh, to mean anything it just needs to seem like it means something to parliamentarians do you know what i mean i, I don't think i don't think it will i don't think it will um well, i don't think it will sadly it, it will I, just, I think just the, push I, I the think, story i think the situation we are seeing um when you look at some of the constituencies you know wh which way they voted so you know you've got solid conservative constituencies you know voting heavily brexit yeah. Um, you've also in the north of England got solid Labour seats voting in some cases 45% and over 50% Brexit party in this. I yeah. think that does seem to threat, that must surely send a, a sort of a, a shiver down the spine of some of the MPs who are sitting there. Um, you know, whether it's whether it's Labour in the north or whether it's Conservatives in the south or whatever, you can see that they're kind of realizing, uh, could my majority be eroded? I think that's that's the main question. It's not would Brexit win? It is would sufficient number of people who you usually would vote Tory in the south vote for Brexit and thereby let a Lib Dem or a Labour candidate win the seat instead? And the same in those Labour constituencies. And I think that is in a way the threat. That's where the pressure is coming from. 
it, yes, but all, all that's gonna all that's gonna happen. But I mean, I I made a I don't know if anybody's had the chance to make the uh, I only made a little five minute video uh, earlier to sum up my thoughts. Oh, but, I thought um, you I thought you were gonna say I made a bet. No, no, no. <laughs> I, I don't know if you guys had a chance to look at that yet, but I, I, I can see it. In, I've seen it come up on Twitter just as I came on here. I, so I've, not had I, it I, I've watched it, it yet. I, I, can, I can very quickly sum up what I say there, which is that, or, yes, I, I agree, but sure, it sends a signal, and it means that um, the Tories are going to have to become more Brexit y, and the uh, Labour Party are going to have to become more Remain They have to. As, a, as an existential matter for each of them, they have to shift to where the majority of their base is. Would you agree with that? Um, and I'd also said that it's a very difficult thing for both parties because for the Labour Party, they have to write off their home, like their, their traditional stomping grounds, Wales, the North, the Midlands, very Brexity areas. They're going to basically have to say, look, I'm sorry, but we're going to have to write, write off these traditional working class areas to embrace... Um, the, the more cosmopolitan I think folk areas, it, it, and then and then the, and then the second uh, thing is the Tories have to write off uh, and, and do not underestimate the importance to the Tories of uh, places like the Green Belt or um, you know around yes, here so where I live. You know, the, the, this was a Tory seat when I moved in. Now it's such a heavily Lib Dem seat. I don't see the Tories getting back in. So, so they so they have to write off those areas. Um, Hold on a second. Uh, then the, the second thing I said was, uh, yeah, so that's where the parties have to go. But politically, I don't. both parties don't want a general election. Okay, They don't want to give uh, Farage a chance to set up in 650 seats. And they've got until 2022. And as long as they've got until 2022, the MPs who are currently there and the MPs who were there under Theresa May are going to stay there, right? And as long as the MPs stay as they are, they are majority remain MPs and they can frustrate Brexit and they can slow it down and they can cause all the problems that they've done that made it so impossible under May. And even if it's Boris, that's even better for Labour because then they can turn around and say, oh, look, even Boris Johnson couldn't deliver Brexit. Now you have to remain. Do you understand what I'm saying? This is an interesting thing because the... Uh, so also, you think the European Union as well, because obviously the default is still that we kind of flop out on the 31st of October now. Um, I do not think that it's a tenable position for them to seek another extension um, past October 31st. But do you think what will happen is as we approach that, the EU, EU is going to, because um, this is what I think the EU is going to do, I think the EU is going to come uh, poisonous olive branch in hand and say, look, uh, you know you're not going to go for another extension, but uh, you know we've mentioned it before. You can still remain if you'd like um, at the 31st of October, and and then I think they're going to be stuck there. They know that they're going to get slaughtered in another referendum, so the second referendum noise doesn't particularly bother me, um, just because I think there's more respect in the nation as a whole um, for democracy as opposed to. Um, like the kind of hard remain position. I think there's enough remainers, certainly that I know, um, and particularly hard remainers as well, who go, look, this is ridiculous. If we wanted to, if we want to remain, uh, we should, uh, we should come out and then we should petition to, to go back in again effectively. Um, not that I think that's a tenable position, I, as in, in terms of like the EU would never allow it, but I think that that's just what they believe because they hold democracy more sacrosanct than um, compromising their principles in order to uh, remain in the EU. Yeah, re realistically, I don't, I, realistically, I don't see that at all. I see every principle being compromised. I see the entire political class doing whatever they possibly yeah, can. Yeah, yeah, the, poli the political class is to... one thing, but the people who yeah, but... are only political for like a week, a year, I don't think it's... But, but at, at what point are you going to realise that votes don't really matter? It doesn't really matter what the... the it, they can it's a they, black they, pill stream tonight. <laughs> well, look, but they can look if, if last night wasn't a sure enough. Okay, last night's uh, results. I was watching it on the BBC. The the Brexit Party were killing it in every seat. That that graphic you showed us, where basically if you treated it like general election, they won basically every single seat. Okay, and the takeaway was still from Tory MPs in the studio. They were saying, "Oh, the the message we need to take from this is compromise." What? 
the message the message we need to take away from this is um really that we need to compromise that we need to find a way to do this without uh, causing the damage of no deal they were still saying that last night every single tory yeah we hear what you're saying but actually we don't really hear what you're saying and as long as those people could don't forget they're the ones with the power they're still mm-hmm. sitting there and they can sit there until 2022 okay as long as that's the case they hold the cards we don't hold any cards because we have no power we just have this uh, illusory power called a vote that we do every once in a while do you, want to, do you understand what i'm saying that they they're, can... they're, i just i wonder again like the the i think they're playing off the potential of what it would take to rile the british people to direct action protest which i think we're still a long way off um i just because brexit is such a wishy-washy issue um it doesn't really it because it's a sovereignty issue right like it, it's a uh, what happened with the centralized government to give us more control to decentralize it for one side. And it's like one part is the centralized government so that we can retain power for like the big government guys. And then for the remainers, they, I don't think they really understand the difference between the EU and, and, uh, and so on. They just disillusioned with our local quote, local government. So uh, it, it, I just don't think it hits people in the wallets. I don't, I don't think it hits people on the dinner table. I don't think it's hitting people in the workplace yet. Um, or I don't think it will at all, actually, um, if they continue to frustrate the process. And those are the things, like, um, you know, if you if you make someone go hungry for a day because suddenly there's no food in the, in the supermarkets, that's something which will spur someone to go and actually yell at Parliament. And then if nothing is being done and it seems like there's a yeah, clear way out about, and they go and do it. But Think, think about this now, okay? Um, we know that without any solution, uncertainty is what reigns. And business, big business and small business, does not like uncertainty. We know this. Mm-hmm. And, the, and the longer it's drawn out, the longer it's uncertain, it actually does increase the risk of what you're talking about. And whether it's Brexit or not, take that British steel fact. We, we all know that the British steel scenario is to do with China, right, and to do with global trends in steel. Yeah, that, and the subsidies which prevented but, the British steel from competing. Yeah. But the, the MP of that area is Stephen Kinnock. And the MP of that area says that, oh, uh, if I'm going to lose thousands of jobs here, it's because of Brexit. It's because of Brexit, he will say. Okay? Which is interesting because the majority of the Welsh constituencies were voting, uh, well, either Plaid Cymru or Brexit. And from, like, I spoke to about, like, obviously I'm, and it's not a representative sample, right? But I spoke to around five, six hundred um, Welsh benefits recipients when I was doing a, a study in the area, and uh, the sentiment overwhelmingly there is Brexit's not causing this issue. Um, the EU has caused an awful lot of these issues. Um, like, there is no work here, and we're all dependent on um, like the government payouts, and we've moved to universal credit now which means that I can't even afford to save a little bit of my benefit payments so I can eventually get a bus out of here to somewhere more lucrative. That's what, the sentiment that I've been getting. What, it, what does it matter if the man who represents them says it's to do with Brexit? And he's the one who goes on TV and he represents them. So what difference does it make? I mean, you could always get the guillotine out. You, do, do you understand what I'm saying? Nobody's going to do that, though. No, they, I know. Like I said, they, they, they can barely... Um, they can barely get through a week. You know, you're saying they're on universal credit. They can't, they, you know, they're living hand to mouth. So, they are, they are. So, so, so what are they going to do? <sighs> I mean, I, 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 I don't want to, I don't want to sound too, I'm, I'm just saying, watching the, I, I don't know if you, uh, I know you were streaming, Mark, but mm. sure, I don't know how much of the coverage you saw last night, but the, the big takeaway is that they're not going to change. They're not going to, there's nothing Nothing about last night. Or Theresa May's resignation seems to have changed. Well, you know, uh, I, the, the way I would look at it is um, that was what, that's what, that's what they were saying while they were on air. But remember, politicians, you know, the safe they've, face. Got, they, they've got, you know, they're basically a sort of a herd animals. That they will go in a certain trend, uh, and at the same time, all of them are very interested in staying MPs. So, 
what we have particularly on the conservative side is we've got a leadership you know uh, contest coming up now you know they will fall in line behind leaders if they think that that's what that's what will you know get them their seat back so that they will you know they'll continue to be MPs and, and I think particularly when it comes to um grassroots conservatism um that is I think there may be a growing chance of people beginning to be deselected if you know what I mean um because I think there is a big rift between I know she's no longer in it, but the sort of the Anna Subri wing of the Conservatives and the grassroots Conservatives who are actually in the constituency associations. Mm -hmm. So I think, I think to a certain extent, they will suddenly begin having a change of heart if a change of course in the leadership is signalled and that has got the backing of the Tory grassroots. Do, do you understand what I mean? So when it comes to the immediate evening in which it all happens, they're all sitting on television waffling as per usual. But we've you know we've we've all seen how how politicians can suddenly have their road to Damascus moment if they suddenly realize that otherwise it might be an existential threat to their remaining MPs. Mm. I don't know though. I look at I look at Anna Subri herself, and the, the levels of delusion. With, you know, take that Rory Stewart who's running now. Okay, mm -hmm. he said he couldn't serve under Boris. He's already come out and said that. Um, I'm pretty sure the Greening's come out and said that, and I'm pretty sure Rudd has come out and said that. Mm -hmm. So, so what what happens when um, Boris becomes the new uh, PM, for example, and, 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 and they decide they were going to leave the party? They're going to join Cucks, or they're going to join. Uh, yeah, that could happen. Yes, they don't have to have a by-election, do they? Yeah, yeah, true, true. Yes. So they could just undermine him that way, as long as the parliamentary arithmetic stays the same, and we don't have a general election. Well, yes, but that's just they... it. If 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 they if they change the parliamentary arithmetic too far, then Jeremy Corbyn stands up and says, "Fine, <laughs> let's let's have a vote of confidence." And so then, I, and I, I can see what you mean, but I, 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 do, I really... Do you, do you I, understand, I, though, the, the Labour Party, who are very bullish about calling a general election, it's still on the wave of 2017, yeah, I think... They, they claim yeah. to be bullish, and, yeah. and they're, I'm they're not a, sure they really are. Well, they're a lot less bullish now, right? Yes. So after last night, I guess one thing that has changed is that the Labour Party really don't want to go back to the... They don't want a general election now, because they think they might lose, or they think they might struggle to you know that they, they, they don't know what would happen if they call a general election now so they they need to see what happens with brexit and ideally let the tories own that issue entirely right um but let's pretend that um uh they can hobble on till 2022 which is what i think that they're both going to play for at this point because if you if you're a labor mp right what, what, and your your sole aim is to maximise your chances of staying in your seat for the foreseeable future. Um, what's the better option? Going to into the uncertainty of a general election where you could be voted out, or just holding on to it till twenty twenty two? What would you do? They just hold on to it, right? I I'm not sure. I think they're 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 always looking ahead of what will win it me next time. And I think this point, if you were a Conservative MP, given the overall sentiment, I mean, you've, you've seen what's just happened across the map. I mean, the Tories don't really exist in Scotland anyway, if you know what I mean. <laughs> um, in England, it is just a sea of Brexit party. So unless you're really a, um, a London constituency Conservative MP, I think the signal has been pretty strong telling you, you know, what your Tory voters want of you. I don't think they're going to listen, though, because you've got to think of, right, OK, a lot of MPs, a lot of your basic bitch MPs are a lot closer to Chucka Ramuna and Anna Subri mm -hmm. than they are to either Corbyn or Boris. Yes. 
But right. that also means they have no real life experience. No. No. They don't have a job. They don't want to right. lose their job I, in, in, in 22. I know that, but they're not stupid, right? Cuck, cuck, cucks, they did awfully. One of the one of the big stories was that they got no votes, right? None yes. of them. Okay. Um, now, now, the public clearly aren't where they are, right? Aren't where the cucks are. You know that they're they're either with the Brexit Party or they're with the kind of Lib Dem message, right? Yes. Um, but lots of those, lots of the uh, MPs in Parliament are much closer to where the cucks are. Mm -hmm. um, now they know that they are basically electorally toxic at this point, so they're going. Their incentives are not to have an election, to avoid going to the polls, to avoid the wipeout, or to avoid the chance of deselection, or to shift their position. Well, we'll see. We'll see if they shift their position. You see, if they're if they're thinking until if they're thinking until twenty two, then they're just basically they'll continue to hedge. I agree, but if they want to be MPs after twenty two, yeah, then they will have to shift their position because otherwise they will not be acceptable to their to their constituencies, and. That's where I and, and you know what I mean. They, they, these people, all these Chuka Amuna types and whatever, they have no career outside politics. These are not business people who have. We know that Parliament nowadays is full of professional politicians. Mm -hmm. So, if they, if they lose their seat in twenty two, they're out, and that's that's horrifying to them. That's that that's an existential threat to them as far as they're concerned. So they will see, well, what will keep me in my seat from 22 onwards so I can continue to ride the gravy train, so I can continue to, you know, build up my parliamentary pe pension and all that. And I think it will be fairly clear to them. In just the same way as in some Leave constituencies, it will be absolutely clear to those MPs that they must shift, to, uh, sorry, not Leave, to the Remain constituencies. They will have to shift to Remain. You know, uh, I think it's fairly clear that the, that the politicians will follow where the where the political lead shows. Do, I think ask, we'll see a hardening of positions on both sides. Let me ask you this question though: Do you think that those staunch those those MPs who are convinced that for whatever reason they are staunchly pro EU, whether they admit whether they admit it publicly or not? Like I, I take Rory Stewart as my example. Okay. Mm -hmm. Um, do you think that he values his seat uh, at more than he values uh, us somehow uh, remaining? You know? we'll, we'll, we'll see. I mean, he, he can be, you know, either he will be the politician who will shift his ground, or he will more than likely phrase it as in, you know, uh, oh, he will take his 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 uh, guidance from the leadership or something like that. You know, he he will find a way in which he will be able to explain his uh, selling out his principles and now changing tack in order to maintain his seat. He will either do that, or he will be the equivalent of a knight in shining shining armor at full gallop in a joust, heading towards a tank coming to the other way. Hmm. What do you think, Mark? I like it's it's really hard because for me this kind of speculation um, it, it, it's really difficult. I get what you're saying about the fact that they have this extra three years, um, and that if I'm trying to think what I would do if I was in their position and if I was like a complete careerist, right? Like if I uh, was just thinking about myself and if I was like that. Most of them like this hardcore remainer. I think that. It's going to be terrible. It's going to increase my workload. What am I going to do? My constituents are, in the most cases, voting to leave. Um, I I just don't know how long. Like I think it all hinges upon like the tolerance of the British part uh, British public, because I think that politicians will try and get away with as much as they physically can until they're forced not to, and I think that being like the british way has traditionally been like what's the polls on this what's the uh like the opinion and because they're all the polls are kind of like a proportional 
representation thing. And I know you can't trust pollsters typically, but like they're flipping back and forth. It's very clear to me that the sentiment has not changed dramatically on either side. Like me and uh, Uzlu were adding up the vote share um, last night um, for, you know, we, we were taking a little bit of a guesstimate about like, uh, how much of Labour and how much of the Conservatives had gravitated to each side. But the, the dead set of it was, it was about 50-50 remain to leave um, if, if, you, if you worked it out our way. And so, like, regardless, in the most conservative uh, manner for remain, it was like a 6% majority for leave. And in the most conservative one for leave, it was, uh, you know, about the same the other way. And so you're just going, you know, good grief, like the nation hasn't shifted. It's been three years. Uh, and because, you know, the EU hasn't stopped doing the, what the EU does, and the British public, you know, despite some Remainers having uh, transitioned to leave and leavers transitioning to remain, like the general sentiment in the public is, it's still about 50-50. And so because for the politicians, there is no, like they have this mandate of this slim majority, um, like as much as people want to go 1.4 million people or whatever it was, um, it's still like uh, electorally and percentage wise, not that much. And so you're going, they're saying like, is there a possibility that we can sway like between five and 10% of the population to come over our way to, to see it our way or like, you know, because it's so contentious, they know that they're going to alienate like at the very least like whatever way they choose, they pick hard remain, they pick hard leave. Um, they are going to alienate like a significant portion of their voter base. Ridiculous, because as we noted with the referendum, it was not a uh, it was not a party political issue. You know, it, people were freed from the shackles of the party political system. You had obviously like you had votes from all over the shop. It didn't matter what your previous tribal affiliation was. Um, you know, it was pretty. From what I saw, anyway, it was. You know, there was a huge chunks of different parties voting in different directions. Um, so for them, they're kind of they feel like they're in a bit of a stalemate because they know what they want. And I think that's why they're sticking with what they want, because they still think that it doesn't matter really because it's because it's 50 50. I'm going to side with my 50 as opposed to their 50. Do you know what I mean? No, no. You see, I, 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 there's a few things I disagree on. But first of all, a question. Go on. Um, what do you make of the fact that uh, 63% of people didn't vote? Uh, I think it represents the fact that even now, when Brexit and European uh, elections have been, like uh, as in European Union, sorry, has been on the table for three years now, public interest in having a say in the affairs of the European Union has not gone up significantly. And this election for us, like I think across Europe, um, voter turnout was up nearly 10%, like it was quite significant. But here, the change in voter turnout overall was only up 2%, which is in the region of like normal swing for the turnout for these elections. So uh, like, I just... But to... doesn't, doesn't that tell you that in the long war of attrition that they're trying to you know, to ensure that this doesn't happen. In in that long war of attrition, they've basically turned off, what, half the people who voted last time? Well, can, you know, the, the thing I would say about the, you know, the, the fact that a lot of people didn't vote, um, I think one can interpret that two ways. One can see it as, oh, well, they didn't care. Or one can see it the other way, because th that's what I sort of tweeted at Uzulu when, you know, the, the speculation was being done, as in how do these figures fit together? Um, because there is a good chance that even though, the, as far as European elections were concerned, the vote share went up, it's actually possible that for certain parties in particular, the, the, um, the turnout will have fallen. Because, I mean, it's, it's kind of usual for parties who are not really doing particularly well, um, for their support base not to turn out. So rather than go and vote for the opposition, many diehards will just not turn out. So I, I also, just to add on to that, uh, I wonder how many people who are Brexit-minded boycotted this election because it shouldn't have been happening. 
there is there's that possibility but the, the thing i would point to the, it, the, the one thing i would show is uh i think the brexit party won 29 seats now yeah ukip had in the last election won 24 seats yes so i think it's fair to say all of those 24 seats went to the brexit party yeah man that means some. the brexit party won five more seats on top of the ones that were already ukips now if you look at it the tories lost 15 seats now that means they lost 10 more seats than the ones that went to the brexit party now is that that they had that many remainers among their ranks who changed and went to other parties you know the lib dems the greens or whatever or is it that a lot of tories didn't turn out and therefore their proportional share compared to the others fell this a similar thing oh, yeah. could have happened on the labor side and that's that's why it's so difficult to kind of interpret these things because in in these sort of elections there are two ways in which you can punish your party you can either go and vote for the for, for the, the, the protest party or you can not turn out at all i think people treated this european election as uh to, to divorce themselves from their tribalism once again and voted on as if it was a yes no to um eu membership again well i mean that clearly seems to have been the case largely with those who turned up but what of those who didn't turn up because as the academic agent just pointed out compared to the actual referendum and whatever far fewer people turned out here yeah but compared so, to eu elections in history yeah, it's true. about right true yes yeah. but the eu elections don't compare to the referendum or to a general election no you so can't draw there off. is there is a dormant part that didn't turn out yeah. now the question is who are those dormant voters who do they normally vote for and yeah. my guess is labor and tory yep me too yeah no I'd, I'd agree with that i can um, get on board with that it, but there's also the, the other thing i want to disagree with mark on is and and, and uh, partly with you as well british show is that i think for, for whatever reason um the the current political class uh, you know those 400 and odd mps who consistently voted together on so many different you know all those votes they had all those motions and so on you know the, the basically the ones that frustrated the whole process under theresa may mm -hmm. that we talked about um i think most of those have convinced themselves um uh really that the voters are wrong on this issue that the that it would be too much of a you know and in their own minds they're thinking hold on a second um it's going to be a disaster if i support this um it's bad i need these you know i need these jobs i need these jobs in my constituency and if these jobs are lost under my watch you know it, it doesn't matter what they ask for now the worm will turn the mob will be after me uh you know then my you know so i think they're calculating things in that way they're thinking basically they know better than the voters uh when it comes to this matter i, I don't think that's in the doubt but but do you understand what I'm saying though? So you so the normal political logic of just you know going where the voters go on an issue like uh, gay rights or abortion or some of these things where they can just kind of follow the winds a bit more or an economic policy or it it's it seems a bit more fundamental. Well, they're yeah. they're following the kind of the tower and a square mentality. They think that they've got a, a better view from the top of their tower of bureaucracy and. Uh, like they've interacted with the EU more so than the, any typical member of the general public. They think that they therefore have are more well informed, and that the public was dreadfully uninformed. And most of them are convinced as well that the uh, referendum itself was like effectively illegal because of like, different bits of but funding. Do they, and but do they want to? Are they prepared to fall on their sword for it? That's the question. I I think they might be. I think like. Uh like a like a Stephen Kinnock or a, I'm just thinking like bog standard MPs or Emily Thornbury or it doesn't matter which seats they're in it doesn't matter how their seats are voted they haven't changed their stances but, but, but in so many cases the MP is is in like a you know 60 55 percent Brexit area and they still talk as if they are representing a Remain area well, I think it's the the. It's the, because the, they're representing minority interests. The, the <laughs> chief, the, the the best example of that is Yvette Cooper, 
whose Northern Labour constituency, I believe, voted over 69% to leave. Yeah. <laughs> and she's staunchly for uh, remaining. Um, so much so that she was the one who was uh, part of the bill that made it impossible for us to leave. Um, you know, w without a deal. Remember, her and uh, what was the Tory called? Um, uh, Malthouse. Uh, yeah, no, no, no. That, that's um, he, he was he was talking about the Malthouse deal once in a while, but that's not his name. Um, oh. uh, uh, I remember Letwin. Yes, Letwin, the Letwin Cooper bill, or whatever. Yes, it's yeah. So basically, her constituency is almost seventy percent leave. Um, so that was that's going to make an interesting um, election because I yep. could well imagine the Brexit Party finding a uh, a candidate who is basically um, acceptable to a Labour audience and fielding him in that constituency, but uh, with with Leave as the target. So I, I can see Bre I can see the Brexit Party doing serious damage. To, to some to some folk. Yeah, but this goes back to what I was saying. If you're a vet Cooper, why not just sit pretty until 2022? And then and then and then, you know, by that point, maybe they frustrated Brexit long enough that people well, give up on it. Or... In her case, I think she can do that because she can afford to lose her seat. She can afford to lose her seat and still have a, a career. Well, I, but think, I think uh, like most as, French as... MPs, that is not a calculation that they can afford. I think it's also the case that eventually one side or the other, because the Remainers are convinced that the government is like committed to Brexit and therefore that's a problem, um, and the Leavers are convinced that uh, the government is not committed to Brexit and that's a problem. How long is it before one bright spark guy forks the whole thing? Mm, I don't quite follow. Well, do you, you understand what I'm saying? Like the uh, like the idea of a deal is repugnant to any of the hard remainers. The soft remainers are like, we don't want to lose our vote in the EU. Therefore, any kind of Brexit, we're not going to be uh, happy with. There's like a slim majority, uh, slim uh, section in the middle who are saying, uh, you know, like we don't want this. So you get this frustrated process of like continued bureaucracy costing money and more and more. The Remainers in particular are getting pissed off about how much it's costing because uh, Brexit, I think, comprised something like 17% of uh, house time over the last three years. And uh, they're getting to the point where I'm starting to see more and more of the kind of uh, people coming up, especially to like the Tory candidates, right? And saying, like, I think I saw something with Dominic Raab the other day where um, like people going, uh, the. We're, like our people are dying, you know, because of this. You know, it's sort of. Um... Well, I, I'm quite. I'm actually quite uh, content with um, Parliament being completely scuppered for for considerable time and not the being able years. to churn out more nonsense. Um, you know, imagine how many other upskirting bills we would have had had it not been and, for Brexit. Okay, just because nothing bad is happening, it doesn't mean that it's not bad that nothing's happening. <laughs> <laughs> you know, in either direction. I, I tell you what, though, we've been we've been speculating for about fifty minutes now, nearly. Um, so I'm gonna I'm gonna take some super chat questions, um, and we'll try and answer those before you know, unless you want to put in a last comment. Here. This is probably a good time for me to duck out because I have to make a steak now, traps. So, well, fair yeah. enough. You're you're more than welcome to pop back if you need yeah. if you want to. But nice enjoy to enjoy, you. enjoy having your steak. All right, bon cheers. appetit. Lovely. Um, you know, if, if I could just just chime in just brief, just for one moment, um, because, you know, when we were talking about Yvette Cooper and whatever, the one thing I think Yvette Cooper can rely on is to get an Andy Burnham or Vera Baird job. You know, those were politicians who had a certain rank within the Labour Party who were found other positions. So Vera Baird is police commissioner for Northumberland. Uh, Andy Burnham is mayor of Greater Manchester. You know, they they kind of looked after by the p p party machinery. Yeah, Yvette Cooper can afford to go full tilt and fall on her sword because the the Labour Party will look after her. She is sufficiently prominent. But if you've just got your bog standard MP 
you know, just the backbencher who, who, you know, never whole held a ministry, some, some minor, minor constituency somewhere out in the sticks. Those people don't have that parachute. And that's why I think it's those people who will suddenly have their road to Damascus moment and start thinking, oh, well, you know, perhaps it's not that bad an idea. We will certainly see. We will certainly see. The uh, the British Knight uh, has said, do you think UKIP will weather this storm or will it be gone in a year? I hope it survives long enough for the Brexit party to predictably sink or comfortably swim. Um, well, I think they've had a severe blow last night. I think, that, you know, they, they and Change UK pretty much limped in. The biggest, so I, I've been chatting and I'm obviously in several uh, rooms with um, relatively high profile kippers. Um, the big thing at the moment is will Gerard Batten continue to lead the party? Um, his deputy, Mike Hookham, has uh, effectively tried to stab him in the back. Um, so, But no one in the party is supporting him from what I can see. He's picked a, the wrong moment, the wrong time, the wrong issue. So he's gone. Uh, Batten is tired of, of running UKIP, but whether he chooses to stay on principle um, is another matter entirely. Um, I know there's two candidates who are going to go up um, to run against him in the leadership election that's supposed to be happening um, shortly, I think next month, but we'll see. Um, Sargon is not abandoning UKIP for, for one thing. Their membership is still up, and I don't think... I, I think the next month is going to show whether or not they take a hit in cancelled uh, memberships and so on and so forth. But um, Sargon has made it very clear, for instance, and he's really the driving force of their um press wing i would say apart from chris hicks who's the press lead who is obviously um still going to maintain doing the, the marketing and so on for themselves but like they they're, they're going to continue pushing forward with the platform of going out and talking to everyday people and continuing to grow their youth wing because that's where they're getting the most members at the moment is in the youth vote um so so that's their plan there i don't think they're going to sink i don't think they'll rise as high as they were predicted to before Farage got involved just uh, yet, although if a general election is delayed till 2022, they've got three years in which to manoeuvre for all this stuff without having to shell out for um, all the kind of pre-election literature and so on and so forth. So um, they they can come back from a place of strength. But it's interesting as well that they haven't dipped as low as they did once Farage left. They dropped down to like 1.8% um, or something in the polls, and they still managed... Uh, three point something percent of the vote share this time, so um, it's not a win. But I don't think there are that many in UKIP who are seeing it as a loss. Although uh, there has been some sentiment of that on, uh, well, on know, some the, of the, pages. the thing. The thing that I think endangers them is simply relevance. You know that for the smaller parties, it is very very difficult to get a hearing. You know to to get to get the press to in any way report on anything they have to say. So, um, you know, I mean, it, it was it was famous, you know, that the Lib Dems always struggled. You know, they could have their party conference, they could be waving banners and whatever. But if you would ask the general public, OK, what has been decided? Nobody would have any idea what the Lib Dems had ever done, you know. And that's despite there being the third largest party yeah, in the country. Yeah, 100,000 well, members. Yeah. The further you go down, you know, and, and I'm not talking about largest party in terms of membership. I'm talking largest party in, ta in terms of actual, you know, electoral outcomes, if you know what I mean. And that's that's the danger for UKIP, that basically... How many times do you put a UKIPper on Question Time in the next 12 months on, on the BBC Question Time on that panel show, given that they've only got three point something percent of the vote share? Do, 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 do you understand what I mean? It makes it very, very difficult to them, for them to get heard.
Yes, and I know, I know. But the, my, the, more, my, the, question the more that was, is the case, the more their own base melts away from the, them. But they are happy to play the long game. So the question was, do they think they'll weather the storm or will they just disappear in a year? And I tend to come down on the weathering side. That's that's as far as I can go. But I don't want to like speculate about the events and like the chip damage that will be done over time and and stuff like that because we don't know yet and well, I, just... I, I just you know I, I would just say i would point to the liberal party you know where is the liberal party today you know that because there is a rump liberal party that is still left from the merger of the liberals with the social democrats that formed the lib dems that is there are there were some who refused to join and just continue to maintain the liberal party where are the Liberal Party today? And, and that's and that happened pretty fast. It it, it wasn't as if oh it took 20, 30 years. That's what I, I really think that that is the big danger. If if you're in that lower percentage figures, it it's very very difficult to kind of maintain any sort of momentum. But we will have to see. We? we will have to see indeed. Froggy has said AA is Mark's minion today. Would you agree with that sentiment, Brisha? Well, I mean, you know, you're obviously going up in the world. You know, we can we can see that you're getting, um, you, you, you know, more and more subscribers. Uh, I have recently uh, taken to referring to you as Major General. Oh, yes, um, I noticed on Twitter. Yes, yes. So, um... <laughs> I, I was just laughing. I thought you were going to say, I've taken it upon myself to finally subscribe to you. And I was... <laughs> so slowly, slowly, you seem to be going somewhere in the world. So, yes, I mean, you know, um, why, why shouldn't it? Why shouldn't, uh, why shouldn't uh, the academic agent be the academic minion this evening? No, he can be the academic minion. Uh, Matthew Ivey, Sargon and Dank brought in some new blood for UKIP who were already struggling, but it wasn't enough to challenge Farage, who is the face of Brexit. Yes. Um, and I don't think anyone in certainly the upper echelons of UKIP was under any illusions that they were going to storm this European election and win everything. Um, I, I don't think that was the case. Uh, Dylan98 says, I'm a fan of Sargon, but he's destroyed UKIP's credibility with his comments. Was this a 4D move, uh, 4D chess move to destroy UKIP and have people vote for the Brexit party? Um, I, I wouldn't ascribe that level of 4D chess to Sargon. Um, I think that he has either shone astoundingly in his uh, interviews with the news or he's done appallingly. Um, and he's made some comments which have been very easy to misconstrue. Um, and I also think that... Um, Joe and Jane blogs at home uh, who do not have the time to research context around uh, difficult issues, who only get their news from, I don't know, listening to the radio on the way into work and perhaps popping on in the evening, uh, will have got anything other than UKIP candidate supports rape and that this um, goes hand in hand with their established views that UKIP has always been a racist party and also likes to align itself with anti-Islam activist Tommy Robinson. So. Well, I, I would say this much. Um, you know, it, it clearly did damage to their campaign, there's no doubt. Um, but it's it's that fame, it's it's that kind of high wire act that you, you play. Because I noticed, I mean, I, I alluded to that when I was kind of wondering, you know, was UKIP in meltdown or was it kind of seeking to almost you know, deliberately cause controversy because I, I remember there was um, Gerard Batten put out a, a you know a joke where he was um, you know using the word uh, words "fuck me" or whatever in, in in some kind of joke he was telling in 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 a tweet, and you don't really expect to get that on on Twitter from a party leader during an election campaign. Mm. Now, is it that one is just being you know that one is being too loose, that one is being too lax? In, in one's discipline, or is it that one is deliberately trying to kind of cause some controversy in order to get some kind of headlines, in order to get noticed, precisely in order to overcome that handicap of being the party at the bottom of the pile? I think uh, everything's a tactic in hindsight. Um, <laughs> so I, I don't know. That's, that's, that's a good point, yes. but. You, you just wonder what, what what exactly was going on there. I mean, <coughs> I'm hoping to have an interview with with Sargon. Those are the kind of things I would I would kind of be hoping to talk about. You know, 
what what was the outlook and, and on those things? Here, um, here's here's an interesting thing because this is a meme going around at the same time. Um, when it comes to this issue, if I share that. So th this is the thing which is going on here, um, alluded to in that super chat as well. The idea that UKIP m managed to be the untenable position, uh, and I know it keeps coming up, um, but. It was like Sargon was so horrific a candidate uh, in the minds of the media and through the narrative they spun in the minds of the public that, uh, yeah, Nigel Farage could sleep soundly, um, gathering support and no longer being called a, a bigot. Mm -hmm. um, he was not the pariah. Yes. No. Whereas he was always seen as the xenophobe. Yeah, you and know, he's been called all he, was, he was a xenophobe. He's the person who hates foreigners and therefore the little Englander who wants to take britain out of the the eu uh so the, all that was always riding against him and he took a lot of flack whereas this time round, uh you know ukip and and sargon were, were a perfect shield he could basically do the same play the same game that the other parties were playing pointing the finger saying this is disgusting you know this would never happen in my party blah 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 you know, do the virtue signal and get away scot-free and there was there was very little the media could do they, they couldn't divide their fire and and shoot at ukip and nigel farage and and therefore yes he he had a completely unimpeded free run and you know the result of which we have seen yesterday i mean it's it's quite spectacular what he pulled off Absolutely. Um, Patrick has donated $2 and says, what are TPB, I assume it's supposed to be uh, the Brexit Party, TPP, uh, MBP is going to do in the EU, European Union Parliament? Um, I think they'll do exactly what they've done before, which is uh, oppose uh, anything which is going to influence UK policy insofar as they're able. They'll block everything that would influence us. I would suggest that for most of the time, they won't even be there. Yeah, they'll, they'll boycott um, unless it's something which is going to affect us if if they have well, to be there. Put it put it like this: in order to be there, you know, they would effectively have to move there temporarily. And given that they're only supposed to be there for another five months, yeah, um, not... you know, how practical is it for them to find flat for that time? <laughs> yeah, I know. I know. You know, so it, that's where I would, you know, and unless there is some sort of, you know, almost like industry of, you know, MEPs moving out and, and new MEPs get those, the, you know, ready flats, if you know what I mean. Unless there is something like that, then it could happen. But other than that, I could well imagine they will just, as you say, if there's a significant vote or whatever, they will turn up. If there's an opportunity to turn up and and you know shout some abuse at at uh, uh, Jean Claude Juncker or something like that, they will turn up. But other than that, I think you know if it's a if it's a new directive as to how straight cucumbers need to be in supermarkets, <laughs> I don't think they'll turn up. No, um, Mr. Pileri says, "Don't vote. Don't care. We have lost the game." So there's the the uh, the nihilistic outlook, which is in some people. Uh, I don't agree with you, but I uh, appreciate your sentiment. It's good to have that in there. Um, Silly Sailor says, if Tories were smart, Lord Farage and Brexit Secretary, if he says yes, neutralises Brexit Party, if no, they say he's not really interested in Brexit. Um, I'm going to read that again. You yes, can let me know yes, if you understand. I, I, I was as, as confused as you were. If, if the Tories were smart, colon. Lord Farage and Brexit Secretary. If he says yes, they've neutralised the Brexit Party. Ah, uh, so basically offer him a job. I see, I see, I see. Um, and if no, they say he's not really interested in yes, Brexit. Yes, so basically offer him a job and say, okay, fine, you know so much better than you do it, or else uh, kind of, you know, reveal him to the public as, you know, a kind of lightweight who, if given the task, doesn't take it on. That would be interesting. I just don't think that they'd give the job to someone who they've they've reviled for so long. And someone who may otherwise, who may possibly, there is that possibility, make well, it a success off. of it. Yes. You know, that, that would be that would be the death knell. That would be catastrophic for them. So you know, if you give someone the job, 
there is a good chance that they will completely hash it up and you can basically make your point. There is also the possibility they might actually pull it off. Yeah. The uh, so so there's that side of things. Um, McCarthy's list has donated PHP one two five, whatever that is. Um, I think that's nope. I I can't even speculate, and I know where McCarthy's list is from, and I can't even remember what what the currency is. But he says, uh, "Great job, all. The plan is going swimmingly. I think we all knew this was going to get a bit ugly." PHP. Um, will that be Philippines? Would it be? I'm guessing here. <laughs> PHP current. Yeah, Filipino Philippine pesos. Oh, there you go. So there it is. Um, yeah, so uh, as for it all going swimmingly, I don't know about swimmingly. I know it was going to be choppy. Um, it's, it's just a case of we're in a mess now. Um, if AA's cynicism about the kind of staunch delaying tactics of the establishment parliamentarians is right, We'll see one thing. Um, if my blind optimism is another, we may see another option. Um, and, you know, it may end up, I think it'll be somewhere in the middle. Well, well I, I just think, yes, that, that there will be the Yvette Cooper types or whatever, you know, the diehards who are willing to go down on the Titanic. But I think there are also a lot of others who are right now, you know, they're, they're a bit sheepish, they're a bit, bit in a panic, and they're looking around, and they're looking for a lead, as in, Tell me which way to go, and I will I will be your flag bearer. Do, do you understand what I mean? And and oh, I always understand what you mean, Britisher. I I think that that's that's what's you know that's what will be the majority of the backbench MPs on you know which will then divide into a leave and a remain side, you know, mm. and it will become much more clear. So even though it will still be a muddle because they will kind of divide into these two camps within the Conservatives and within the Labour Party. They will at least form distinctive camps within those two sides and be much more militant about it, if you know what I mean. Um, and, and I think then we then it will be possible for, you know, the journalists and whatever to discern what are the actual figures. Um, as long as there are so many, you know, MPs kind of trying to play both sides effectively that's when you end up with the muddle we've had so far yeah no i at the end, tend to agree um i just see as what what like the next week is going to be key the next week is going to reveal hopefully to the public what the sentiment amongst the mps is um and hopefully uh, traditional media for what it's worth will be able to stick it to them a little bit about um what they think is going to happen and what their position will end up being and and who says what and all it takes is one of them to slip out something that they perhaps wanted to keep under wraps or something which uh just reveals preference a bit more to well, to make it happen i would say i don't think it will be that sudden i don't think it will just be immediately the next week well, you get, think, it depends how much pressure gets put up. Yeah, I think it's a matter of what happens within the Tory party leadership contest. Also true. When is that scheduled, by the way? It's well, like I mean, June... technically, technically it's underway, if you know. Yeah, because I mean. um, she leaves on the, at the end of June. But I think I think you can sort of give, you know, I think sort of it will somewhere be in the space of six weeks and a bit, sure, if, if you know what okay. I mean. So my, my one week is a little bit... Um, so, so I think as as those candidates become more distinct, and particularly now, I think they've been sent a clear message, as in, look, the the parties that have a clear message win. The parties that are muddled and somewhere compromised in the middle, they lose. So I think in that leadership contest, they will be seeking to kind of be able to 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 provide a kind of short, sharp clear message and i think then you know the backbenchers are kind of as that becomes ever and ever clearer i think they're kind of going to cluster around that and that that's where i think you will get a lot of muddled presently muddled mps suddenly come out much more firmly and you will also more than i could get a few converts who will suddenly come to a much more 
a much more tougher Brexit side because, yeah, in the end, they know on which side their bread's buttered. Mm. Mr. Spoon says, I agree with the black pill pharmacist academic agent, but we have to keep the pressure on and hope something turns up. There's not much else to do. Yeah, I mean, uh, we're kind of at our wits end with what we can um, with what we can project with regards to soft power. Right. So it, 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 like there's voting intention, there's turning up to vote after vote after vote. There's uh, protests and so on, which we all know protest is more about making protesters feel good, because unless you like eat, it didn't stop. And the it, also, it also gives the media something to film. Yeah, it, it, it's let, like um, the Iraq war had a million protesters. It did nothing. And that is uh, a far more controversial issue that, uh, you know, or it was far more a controversial issue within Parliament than Brexit is. So, uh... yeah, yes, but what what I'm sort of going uh, going for is, do you remember the big anti Brexit Brexit rally that that happened on on some weekend a few weeks ago? Mm -hmm. You know, and it, it was sort of deep, oh, another one of the biggest biggest protests. Yeah, in, about in three hundred eighty thousand or so. And um, you know, it, immediately the 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 press kind of gathered lots of sort of uh, you know emotive shots and gave us a narrative of this is the voice of the people. D do you understand what I mean? So that's what I mean, that the protests, yes, they give the protesters uh, something to shout about and something to do and something to feel good about. But at the same time, it also provides a, a handy backdrop for a media with a narrative. Yeah, no, I totally agree. Um... Matthew Hatch, uh, who was asking where the super chat button was earlier, glad you found it, man, says, Misandrist Derbyshire, that'd be Victoria Derbyshire, traumatized a sexual assault survivor, Carl, by exposing him to two rape jokes and normalized rape. Jess and the mainstream media cheered her on. Yes. <laughs> it's interesting. Uh, like, and, and you saw that with, um, like, in a completely unrelated uh, story. Uh, you saw that kind of with, like, Milo. Do you remember when he was completely eviscerated for his like uh, his his story of uh, the priest and the paedophilia yes. Yes. and so on? And nobody looked at it from the point of view of he's a victim yeah, who the me, hasn't clicked that he's a victim yet. The hashtag Me Too narrative suddenly disappeared, didn't it? Yeah, and the um, it was interesting because I watched uh, the conversation he had with Peterson uh, recently and talking about how it took him starting to have a relationship with uh, like a loving fatherly relationship let's hope with his stepson uh to even realize that what happened was something horrific and not something he was in control of um yeah it's just a, a second thing there uh and js has just turned in a moment ago and said the northwest chose a bnp mep in 2009 why did Tommy Robinson fail so badly? Um, it was a couple of reasons from my perspective. Um, the first of which was he campaigned very late. Um, he went round the um, doing his tour, and I believe the main bulk of it started after the deadline to register to vote had um, uh, had passed. So if he did swing anyone to his side. Uh, who was already who was not previously interested in voting? They wouldn't have been able to vote. Um, secondly, he's an independent candidate, so people who vote for him are voting for not uh, kind of the principles of a party, whatever they may be, but for Tommy Robinson and all the baggage attached to Tommy Robinson. So, uh, like, even people voting for the BNP for these sorts of things will have been going. Um, yeah, like we want them to become a party and we want them to have like an influence in government eventually and they, they can represent us. But Tommy Robinson is like a one issue guy. But all, um, additionally, uh, Tommy Robinson's entire platform is predicated on uh, opposing and attacking um, radical Islam and uh, everything around the grooming gang scandal. Um, Brexit is not really his issue. Um, and if you ever see, if you've ever seen any of the Brexit-related rallies he's turned up to, he rarely, if ever, speaks about Brexit. He'll often bring it back to um, 
his recent projects. He was bringing up panodrama. He was bringing up like uh, like extra projects that he wants to do when Brexit is dealt with. Um, but he didn't actually have that much to say on the European project. Well, when it comes to Tommy Robinson, I would say, as you said, when you compare that with the BNP side of things, always remember that if you're talking a party, you're talking uh, uh, an organized party structure. So the BNP was a national party. If they realized that in a particular area, they would have a chance of winning something, they would pretty much bus people in, even if even if it meant from other areas, in order to help out. Mm -hmm. Because that's how parties work. They kind of they target things and they concentrate their assets in that particular area. That that means that parties will always have a big advantage over over an individual that tries to do something like that. So that's the big thing. A, a party means that you have an organization that that can you know bring. Uh, assets to bear, so to speak. Um, on the other hand side, I would say that, as you were alluding to before there, you know, the, the big story here was Brexit. And um, Brexit isn't, you know, Brexit isn't the chief cause with which um, Tommy Robinson is associated. So in a way, this was a sort of tangential cause. And therefore, I think it was particularly in the light of what happened with the Brexit party, that steamrolled things. I think it was very difficult for him to get traction. Uh, aside from the fact, of course, that with his being who he is, uh, he pretty much got completely ignored by the media when it came to coverage of yeah. anything he was saying. No, so, no, no one covered anything, and the only time he featured was when, when he was, he was attacked. No, no. When he, well, he when he was attacked by, um, uh, I don't even think he got that much when he was milkshaked. It was when he was attacked by the Islamic Defense League. Well, um, actually, actually, when he was milkshaked, I think he got more coverage for that, which is worrying in my mind. I think he got more mainstream coverage of that than he did when his his rally was attacked oh i i think his rally was attacked. like i didn't don't think it, the rally was represented correctly but i think that like even even if we're just going off that those two incidents no one talked about his mep campaign yeah, yeah. it was purely about the events surrounding it and uh you know whether or not it was just like you know so, tommy, so, tommy yeah, robinson I'm... could have got milkshakes on any other day of the year and yes. it would still have broken the news yeah. in a way. So, so I think I think that's the explanation as to why Tommy Robinson failed to get any sort of impact. Because, you know, in in that, I mean, there was a reason he was standing in the northwest. You know, I mean, he's based he's based in Luton. You yeah. know, so there's a reason he was going for the northwest because, of course, that's where you know uh, most of the sort of big grooming gang scandals broke. So that's where he was sort of targeting you know because he kind of knew that those would be areas that would be kind of quite angry and would be willing to vote for him but i think all that was completely swallowed up by the brexit party that just steamrolled yeah. the whole thing it is worth noting and, and kudos to him for getting more votes than any other independent candidate in history but uh, it, I think he was within about eight thousand, eight to nine thousand votes of Change UK. Something like that. he got over oh. forty thousand. Yeah. Well, no, I think it's thirty-eight thousand nine hundred, roughly. He was at when, okay. when I saw the figures. Um, so it, it, he he was just under forty thousand. But as I say, they were somewhere in the sort of in the mid to high forty thousands. So he wasn't that far behind. What was okay, admittedly, a small, you know, a, a poor showing, but nonetheless a national effort by a by an organised group. Mm. So, you know, it kind of shows how very, very hard it is for for anybody who is an individual. I mean, more than likely, just about the only individual I I these days who would be able to pull it off would be Nigel Farage himself. You know. Other than that, you need a party. It's a team sport, this kind of thing. Yeah, I'd, I'd agree. Uh, just in, a, in terms of resources, um, 
Matthew Hatch is uh, just chimed in as well and said, uh, finish on a laugh. Lord Adonis not selected, right? Uh, no. <laughs> uh, and of course, he's not blaming it on himself. He says, it's very clear that if Labour had been the party of Remain in this election, we would have won. Uh, do you think there's any truth to that statement, Britisha? If, if Labour were the party of Remain... Who would have won? Who is we in this case? We being Labour. Um, if 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 Labour would have had a strict Remain message, yeah, would if they, they have if won? they if they had been the hard Remain party, but they would have they would have garnered the Lib Dem vote. They yeah. would have garnered some, of you know, I mean, some vote. of the Lib Dem votes because I mean the the the, the hardline Lib Dems, you know, the traditional Lib Dems. They would have still voted Lib Dem, so it would yeah, have been if, the it would have been the additional votes that those yeah, parties the, got. The, the Lib Dems Labor would gained have a huge number of seats, but at the, you know, I, I'm not sure, you know, because as I say, that the North of England is very militantly Leave, yeah, and those are heartland Labour issues. Well, it, it, what I noticed interestingly was every city in the North voted Remain, pretty much. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and all the rural areas leave. It's it's sort of the metropol the, the metropolitan areas, you know. The, the, that's the students. That's the that's the that, that's the sort of um, metropolitan middle class and whatever. That, that's a different population in a way. It, it's comparable, like in in the United States of America, where you've got the you've got the coasts and you've got the center of America, and the center tends to go Republican, and the coasts tend to go Democrat. And in in our in our makeup, it's the cities that are labor, and who are also in, in this in in this particular area, they are more pro EU, and the um, the countryside in a way that is that is more leave. The thing, one of the um, one of the amusing things I noted was uh, Gibraltar. Oh, what did they do? And uh, they voted overwhelmingly uh, Lib Dem. I think they had the highest yes, remain. The, yes. the highest margin uh, of any constituency, you know, going in favour of one party. It was like 71% Lib Dem or something like that. But I, I thought it was funny because the two parties, UKIP and Labour, who actually took the time to send candidates over to Gibraltar to talk to the public, were, the, only, were the two parties who lost the most in percentages when they were actually, uh, well, uh, when it came down to it. On that note, there is actually one thing worth mentioning, and that is Labour do not have a MEP seat in Scotland. No. They lost both of them. You know, so the, SM, the SNP, they rallied yet further. Did they? Um, I thought that they lost out some to Brexit, because uh, the Brexit and the Greens, actually. No, I think I think they're pretty much in a stronger position than they ever were. In that, fact, if I I'm, um, I'm going to bring up the ugh, I'm going to bring up the the actual. Uh, but Labour, Labour, they are now at zero MEPs, and you know it's it's interesting while you're looking for that to just kind of keep a historical perspective of this whole thing. When Blair did dev devolution. It was a completely disingenuous exercise. He wanted a uh, Welsh assembly, he wanted a Scottish Parliament, and he wanted regional assemblies in, in England. And the places he wanted regional assemblies, um, you know, the, the first place he actually held a referendum, I, thought, I believe, uh, for a regional assembly was the northeast of England. And they told him to get lost. Mm. And of course, why the northeast of England? Well, Labour, Scottish Scotland at the time, Labour, Wales, Labour. So basically, he was he was dissecting the British Isles into patches, in which he would end up with more patches that were Labour dominated uh, than than patches that were Tory dominated. It was completely cynical. But what has happened is, of course, the whole thing has completely backfired because look at Labour in Scotland. I mean, they've been decimated since. So all those things that were taken as absolute certainties 
have come to haunt Labour in that regard. I mean, Labour have just been hemorrhaging Scotland for the last decade. Oh, yes, um, yes. It's, it's been nothing but... Ever since um, Indie Ref uh, for Scotland happened... It... Well, you've allowed, you've allowed the Scottish nationalists to get a um, political tool with which to introduce all sorts of um, just, nationalist just, propaganda. Sorry, just just so I just so I be clear, I love the fact that a party that is overtly called the Scottish Nationalist Party does not get any flack for being, I don't know, like a far right nationalist, nationalist yes. party. You know, like oh, we must stop the rise of nationalism. Hello, SNP. <laughs> well, I mean, you know you, the. British politics in that regard is full of such contradictions. I mean, um, what she called the uh, the woman who's possibly the front runner now for being the leader of the Lib Dems. Um, uh, um, I haven't been keeping up. With the Lib I, I can't. I can't think of her name right now. Um, I, I remember she has been, you know, pro censorship this and pro censorship that and pro censorship the other. And you just think, hang on, have you ever looked at your party name? It's got the word liberal in it. Yeah, I do. You know. Um, so you've got the Lib Dems being totally pro-censorship, and you've got the Scottish nationalists being against nationalism. And and you look at these things and you just go, um, yeah, where where exactly does any of this make sense? Honk honk, I believe is the uh, the cultural <laughs> term right now <laughs> to make things clear. Um, anyways, um, I am going to uh, sadly uh, bring us to a close there um, because unfortunately I have to get up early tomorrow. Uh, but thank you very much to the to the audience for turning out, um, all 430 odd of you. Um, thank you very much to uh, the Britisher for joining yeah, me. I think the two of us are now going to go away and have our bowl of gruel compared to the academic agent who swans <laughs> off to make steak. I mean, it's potato and leek soup, Britisher. <laughs> Just uh, have a little bit of class. Don't worry, I'll, I'll sprinkle some well, fish flavor. You, you, have, you have potato and leek soup. I have gruel. You see, you, I, you're the I, one, I, you're the one will, who gets the super chats. I will, I will sprinkle some fish food in your brain jar. Have no fear. Um, but it's, a, <laughs> it's I'm not particularly sleepy, guys. It's just that uh, I I have to get up early tomorrow. I have to go to a friend's confirmation. It's going to be fun. But um, take care, everyone. And uh, we'll see you next time on Fake Accents Unite. Take care and have a great week.